Hey Amen. Let me take a moment to thank you for allowing me a couple of weeks ago to unburden my heart and ask for your prayers. Because of your prayers, my heavy heart is lifting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Life is a playground. God has designed it for us to enjoy his creation. But today I want to focus on what Paul focuses on. Life is also a battleground. There are things that happen in life that are inexplicable, some evils we cannot put words to. There are some trials, some temptations, some troubles that come upon all of us in life that cannot be described other than what the apostle is talking about today, an invisible order of reality, a uh, evil and activity in the unseen realm of the world. And so I want to talk a little bit about one fight today. This will be the sixth of our seven messages, one fight. Next week, Eli will close us out. But today I want to focus on one fight. Paul presents all the way now as we come to the sixth chapter, the end of Ephesians, he has presented the church as a body. In chapter 5 last week, he presented it in marriage like a bride. But in chapter 6 here today, he is presenting it as a battle. Sometimes the church moves as a body, one body, and as a bride adorned for Christ. Today it is a battle. We are all in one fight because life is sometimes a playground for us to enjoy God's creation, but other times it's a battleground and we have to endure trouble, trial, tribulation, temptation. And Paul says, here is how you are going to do it. Remember that the Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. And at this point, Rome was the superpower of the world. In fact, they ruled almost a thousand years in their empire. So Paul was used to seeing Roman soldiers, as were many of the occupied lands. But now he was in prison. And they had assigned a special squadron of Roman soldiers to guard him. They seen him as a threat, as the lead of this new movement of Jesus' followers. And so he was seeing them all the time. In fact, at times being chained with them. And he writes in Ephesians chapter 6, and he says, here is a picture of the Christian life. It's a battleground at times, and he compared it to the equipment or the battle gear of a Roman soldier. And so we read these words in Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that's other human beings, but we also wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers that's unseen over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly atmospheric places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having Fasten on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which with you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so he gave these six essential elements of equipment that you and I have. And Paul says, I need to take it up, put it on. How many of you wear makeup? Well, don't raise your hand. 
How many men dress up? It's the same thing. The same as if I'm getting up every morning to make up my face, to dress up my body. Paul says, I've got to get ready to dress up because life is not just a playground, but life is also a... You keep responding like that, this is going to be a short sermon. <laughs> not. And so he says, make it up. That is my attitude, my actions. I have to get up every day because life is going to be playground or battleground, sometimes both, but I need to dress up. I need to make up in my mind, in my actions, so I'm ready to fight. Jesus' followers have an invisible enemy. That's point number one. We have an invisible enemy. Our enemy is not just people we see. It's not primarily us at all. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against an invisible enemy. And our enemy is threefold. One enemy, threefold, the flesh, the world, the devil. Those are our enemies. The devil uses our flesh and his world system to knock us out in battle. The flesh would be our appetites and our desires. Now, our appetites and desires are not always evil. God has given to our flesh some good qualities and traits as well, but it's the appetites and desires that are evil outside of the will of God that knock us down and out in battle. In fact, the definition of lust, biblically, is a legitimate desire seeking to be fulfilled outside of the will of God. And so the flesh has some good characteristics, but it also has some evil appetites and desires. That's invisible. Can't see it, but we know it's real. And then the world has a system, a system of philosophies and beliefs and lies that primarily make God secondary. Things of the world are not intrinsically evil. Televisions, computers, these are not intrinsically or innately evil in and of themselves, but if we believe their lives, their philosophies, it makes God secondary and traps us, knocks us out and down on the battleground of life. And then we have the devil. He actually uses primarily our own flesh, appetites and desires, and he uses the world system in order to knock us down on the battleground. I don't want to burst anybody's balloon, but when trials and trouble and temptation and tests come, let me say that it is not always the devil directly involved. He uses the flesh and the world indirectly. And if the truth be known, because a lot of people ascribe a lot of what's happening in their life as demonic activity, some of it definitely is, but most of it is not. He is using the flesh and he is using the world system, and that trips most of us and knocks us out. Uh, quite frankly, he is not as concerned about many of us because he can trip us up in the flesh or with the world. He uses these systems in tandem. It's an invisible fight. For example, anybody here ever worry? Don't raise your hand. Worry is invisible. It's invisible. It's a fleshly war. It's a fleshly war. The Bible doesn't tell us not to be concerned. It says, don't be overly concerned. So Ephesians 4, uh, Philippians 4 says, don't be overly anxious or overly worry about anything, but pray about everything. Prayer is an invisible weapon. We can't see it, but we use it. It's invisible. And so it is with all of the armor of God. Here's the second thing. Even friends or family can unwittingly or unknowingly become a tool of Satan, even friends and family. It doesn't mean that they are Satan. It doesn't mean that they even follow Satan. It means that sometimes, if we're not careful, we can be unwittingly used as a tool of Satan. Let me give you an example here in Mark 
Jesus says this to his disciples. And he's about halfway through his life on uh, uh, his journey to the cross. So he'd been with them about a year and a half. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine Peter rebuking Jesus? But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Peter. Wake up the person next to you. Get behind me, disciples. Get behind me, opposer. That's what the word means. It means divider. That's what the word means. It means liar. Get behind me. So he says, get behind me, Satan. Why? For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. He knew that Jesus going to the cross would be his end. And Peter, wanting to protect God, good intention, the will of God, said, we're not letting you go to the cross. You're not going to die. And Jesus says, that promotes Satan's interests, not God's. And you are being unwittingly used as a tool. So whenever my interests are above God's interests, Satan is manipulating me and using me as a tool. Remember now. Rome being the superpower of its day, and Paul looking at their uniform, other enemies and soldiers had uniforms, but the Roman uniform was far superior, and it gave them an edge in battle. And Paul is saying, yes, we in one fight. Yes, we have an invisible enemy, but the equipment, the uniform, the assets, that God the Father has given to us on the battleground is far more superior than the enemy. That's a good place to say amen. And so he was writing to these church, this church at Ephesus to say, you don't have to fear. We are in a battle, but your equipment is far more superior. If I had time, I'd tell you we serve the only general. The only general has declared that the victory has been won even before the battle has been fought. That's who we got working for us. So he says, let me describe this uniform, six essential elements that you ought to make up, dress up, put on, attitudinally, and in action every day. First, you have a belt. It's a belt. The Greek word means a girdle. It was in ancient world, it was a long tunic that these Roman soldiers had. They didn't wear pants like we do today. But the belt kept the tunic tight because if it was too loose, then the enemy could grab a loose piece and knock them down to the ground. So the belt tightened up the uniform, held everything in place so they could actually put a sword in it about a 24-inch sword, so that it would not move. Remember, this was hand-to-hand combat. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So I am fighting my enemy hand-to-hand, and I can't have anything on me loose, or it'll be an easy advantage for the enemy. Then a breastplate of righteousness. This is a breastplate. This is like a bulletproof Uh, vest today. It protected the upper extremities, the vital organs like the heart, the stomach, the lungs, the kidney, and etc. And then we have boots or sandals. Actually, the Roman soldiers had an advantage. They would have boots that would be enclosed many times, but they would also have spikes in them so that in this wrestling match, they could not be easily thrown. Their foot would not slip in the sand. The spikes would hold them firm, this kind of sure footedness. And then he says, there's a shield. This is not like a shield that you have on your arm. The Greek word here is like a door, a small door, three to four feet. They would carry this with them because sometimes the enemy would begin shooting fiery darts or arrows. These arrows oftentimes had fire on them, and if they would 
hit the breastplate, then it would burn through it. But the door or shield, they could actually kneel down behind it and be completely shielded from the fiery darts that the enemy was firing. Then there was the helmet. The helmet protected the mind and the head, the brain. And then there was the sword. The sword was this weapon that I could use to inflict harm on the enemy. We use guns today. That would be the equivalent. So what does that mean for us today? Can I take a moment and teach this a little bit? What does this mean for us today? So Paul takes every one of these pieces of equipment and corresponds it with a spiritual skill. The first one is the belt of truthfulness is commitment. Belt of truthfulness. It's not the belt of truth that is objective Bible truth. We get to that with the sword of the spirit. This is truthfulness, faithfulness, consistency. It is having a made up mind. It means integrity. It means that I am committed to the fight. I have to tell you this. I'm a male and I still have a bit of chauvinism in me. And I don't think any girl is stronger than me. And so when I was in high school, I was pretty known for being able to win arm wrestling matches, even against football players and all that. Girl, a girl challenged me in the cafeteria. And it was so funny. And uh, you have a loss to a girl. I mean, I, first I was laughing because, I mean, really? You, okay, fine. And then everybody started gathering around. I'm laughing, and she is serious. And as she is taking me down, and I'm, I said, oh, my God. Am I about to lose for a girl? Then I got serious, but it was too late. That girl beat me. A girl. You know why? She was committed 100%. I was lackadaisical, (laughs) casual, and got serious too late. But it was too late. She had me down. And I was the scourge of the cafeteria for several weeks. All Paul is saying is the belt of truthfulness is commitment. If you're not committed you're going to go on down. If you're not committed, you're going to lose. You can't have one foot in the kingdom and the other foot in the world and expect to be able to stand. That's not how you stand. I've got to say the Lord Jesus Christ is number one on my scale of values. That's my commitment. Even when I fall, I get up again. There is nobody that, is more, that I'm more committed to than him. That's total commitment with integrity and truthfulness. And when the devil knows I'm not committed, you will lose. Here's the second one, conduct. The breastplate of righteousness is simply right living. When I make right decisions, when I do the right thing from God's point of view, it protects my heart. And when it protects my heart, then I'm able to be victorious. If I'm honest with myself, I've made some decisions, some conduct, some behavior that I have paid consequences for, sometimes a short period, sometimes a long period. What Paul is saying is the breastplate of righteousness protects our heart, our vital organs. And when I make right decisions, when I do and have the righteous conduct that God has designed for me, it protects me from the enemy, my flesh and the world system, and I can stand on the battleground. Here's the second or third, the corresponding boots is confidence. Remember, they had spikes. They had sure footing, just like athletes today. Or they had soles, or hard rubber soles, so that if you're on the gym floor, you won't slip. It gave them balance. 
this idea of boots on the ground, the gospel gives me peace of mind. The gospel gives me peace of mind. It gives me confidence knowing that God has rescued me, that he loved me enough to die for me, that he has saved me, that he has liberated me. It means that I have sure footing. And it gives me a confidence that I otherwise would not have. Let me give you an example of how this impacted, say, in the life of Peter. In John 18, John 18, these soldiers came to arrest Jesus. They were in battle gear just like Paul is describing. They came to arrest Jesus. It was near the end. Judas had betrayed him, told him where their secret place was, and they came with knives and swords, all of their battle gear. Jesus knew the hour was near, and he put his disciples behind them, and he told them, you can leave because this is near the end. And then he said this to the soldiers, who are you looking for? And they said, we are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I'm the one that you're looking for. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Let these go. The Bible says when he says, well, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the Bible said all of a sudden the whole garrison fell to the ground. Just by him saying, I am he, it just fell. Now, Peter was back there looking at that. And that's when he drew his sword. Some of you know the story that he pulled his sword, right? And Peter, Jesus said, put up your sword, Peter. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. There's no way you can defeat all of these people. But when Peter saw they fell at his word, it gave him confidence and courage. And he picked up his sword and he went for a soldier's head, Malchus, the Bible, and he ducked and cut off his ear. And Jesus put, picked up the ear and put it back together. <laughs> the only thing that gave Peter the confidence is I know he was saying, well, we can't lose this. I mean, if we are killed, he can resurrect us and we'll just fight again. There's no way we can lose this <laughs> because Peter knew who was backing him up. That's confidence. That's the gospel. That's peace of mind. Paul says, when I'm going through trials and temptations and trouble, you've got to remember, if God is for you, who can be against you? That gives you confidence in the fight. Then faith. He talks about faith. Faith is this shield. Faith gives me the ability to believe beyond what I see. Faith hides me. This is basically what the shield of faith is. Remembering the promises of God and waiting on him. Remembering the promise. No matter what it looks like today, I can be sad today. I can be down today. Things did not go my way today. Life was not a playground today. Life was a battleground today. And before I get totally discouraged, then I remember what the promises of God are, and I wait on him. Now, he may not come when I want him to come, but he's always on time. I've discovered that for as long as I've lived. God is rather early, but he's never late. Yes. He's always on time. And that's what the shield of faith does. Despite what I see, the shield of faith is I'm going to wait on the promises of God. He has never failed me yet. And so faith means believing despite what the external circumstances are based on the promises of God. Assurance is the helmet. Assurance protects my head. It's the knowledge I need. It's the knowledge of knowing this and take on the helmet of salvation that is the knowledge of who God says you are. If you take notes, write this down. The truest thing about me is what God says and not how I feel. The truest thing about me is what God says about me and not how I feel, nor what other people say about me. I need to have this assurance, the knowledge of knowing who God says I am gives me assurance on the battlefield. In fact, 2 Corinthians says this. 
although we do not, uh, although we do live in the world, we live in the world, but we do not wage war in a worldly way because the weapons we use to wage war are not worldly. On the contrary, they have God's power for demolishing strongholds. We demolish arguments and every arrogance that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. We take away, uh, we take every thought captive and make it obedient to the Messiah. The helmet of salvation gives me knowledge and assures me of who I am. When I know who I am and I know who's on my side, then I can live with assurance. I need that knowledge. I close with this. The sword of the Spirit. Don't have to guess about it. He tells us. What is the sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. They work in conjunction. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Now, this is not just knowledge. The sword of the Spirit is wisdom. Wisdom is applying the knowledge. Wisdom is using the knowledge. And so I need to learn how to apply it. And I apply it by practicing it. Don't lose me. I'm trying to go somewhere. And so when I talk about the knowledge of the Word of God, that's the helmet. It's in my head, in my brain. It gives me assurance. Wisdom, however, gives me the ability to know how to use the Word of God just like I can wield a sword. I have to be trained to do it. And in order for me to do it, I have to memorize it and meditate on it so I can use it. An architect has knowledge. They can draw the building. But a builder has wisdom. They can put the drawing together. And that's the difference in knowing the Word of God but using it every single day. I have to use it. When I first came here nine years ago from Texas and my son and I went to get our carrying license, I wanted to tell the state of Tennessee, I'm already certified in Texas. But you know what they would have said. I didn't, but I know what they would have said. We don't care. <laughs> you got to be trained here. And we have to satisfy us that you know how to use this weapon. And I had to train all over again. Now listen, the Word of God is just the same. We have to memorize it and meditate on it so we know how to use it, when to use it. I used to try to teach this to my kids. And uh, they would say, Dad, I can't remember all that stuff in the Bible. I say, you can't? No, I can't. Okay. So every once in a while, Chris, I would say, uh, hey, you know, I was that, that song, uh, uh, we were watching The Little Mermaid. What was the song? And they sang it. I say, okay, um, you remember that song about the, and they sang it. I would tell my son sometimes, man, I think that Magic Johnson and Larry Bird much better than Kobe Bryant. Oh, no, Daddy. No, no. I say, yeah, yeah, they scored more points. No, no. Kobe scored this many points and this many rebounds in this many years. And then I said, oh, really? Yeah. I said, you remember all that stuff? It's amazing how we can remember stats and then say we can't memorize the Word of God. Right. <clears throat> it's amazing how we can remember recipes. I know people who say, my grandmama, I, when I was a little girl, she got, you don't even use the recipe. I have done it so much. It's ingrained. I know how to use it. Wisdom. Right. We can do the same thing with the word of God. If you don't, you will suffer unnecessary scars and wounds on the battlefield. That's why the psalmist says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, her delight is in the law of the Lord. It's in that law does he meditate, meditate, meditate day and night. And as a result, he or she will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Leaves will not wither. Fruit will come in due season. And whatsoever he or she does shall prosper. It's why Joshua says in Joshua 1, 8 and 9, this book of the 
law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate, meditate, meditate in it day and night and observe to do all that is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, says the Lord, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. When I memorize it and meditate it, then I can use it when I need it. It is the sword of the Spirit. So if I'm here today and I need provision, then you can say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If you're out of a job and you have physical needs that you have, you can say that if I, if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to me. If you're here today and you need peace, you can say like Isaiah 26 and 3 that if I keep my mind stayed on him, then he will keep my mind in a state of peace. Or you can remember the words of Jesus who said, my peace I give to you. It doesn't matter what kind of turmoil you're giving. You got my peace, not as the world gives, but as I give. He says, you memorize it, meditate on it, and use it, and you will stand on the battlefield because life is not just a playground, it's a battlefield. It's a battleground. Yes, sir. Oh, gracious God, our Father, thank you that you have given us the assets, the equipment, the armor that we need in order to maintain the victory that you have already won. So we pray today that you would help us to re-examine our commitment, have on the belt of truthfulness, have a made-up mind that we're going to give it all we have in the fight of life. Pray that you would help us to check our conduct with the breastplate of righteousness and making sure that our decisions is according to your righteousness. We're making wise choices to protect our heart and damage to our souls. And if we have failed, we claim your forgiveness and get up again and keep on marching. Thank you for confidence through the gospel of peace because you have liberated and rescued us. We thank you that you have given us faith, hope, trust as we recall your promises and wait on you no matter how dark the day. Weeping endures for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Help us to wait on your promises. Thank you for assurance, the helmet of salvation that gives us knowledge of who we are despite how we feel and what others say. Thank you for your word, the sword of the spirit. Give us wisdom to know how to use it. May we memorize it little by little, line by line, precept upon precept, Meditate on it so that when we need peace, power, provision, purpose for living, we can pull it out and stand. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, we do pray and praise you. Amen. Stand if you would and receive. Hold up one finger. For one, repeat after me with vim, vigor, and vitality. One body. No, I said with vim, vigor, and vitality. One body. One spirit. One hope. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father who is above all, in all, through all. Touch at least six people before you leave and go to the tables in the auditorium.